Do you have a nativity scene in your home? I'm assuming that most Christians do. Tradition actually says that St. Francis of Assisi created the very first Christmas nativity scene. He had made a trip to the Holy Land about 1223, and he had went to Bethlehem, and he was inspired to bring that the idea of that scene back, and, and so he created that very first nativity scene. And apparently it didn't take long to catch on. I, I would imagine that most of us have one. And every time I go to Thailand, Janelle wants me to pick up a nativity scene that they make there in those kilns for Celadon. It's kind of a, I don't even know what it is, it's kind of a ceramic type thing. But uh, several years ago, I actually come across a website that contained what was called Jesus junk, just random things that had been spiritualized. And he had a whole section on weird nativity scenes. And here's some of the most interesting nativity scenes I've seen. Number one here, we have a dog nativity scene. Have you ever seen this? Can you show that picture? There you go. (laughs) Animal lovers uh, rejoice at the site of the Dalmatian as Mother Mary, (laughs) okay? (laughs) Another interesting scene that I come across is for the kids, you know, it's the Lego scene. Have you seen this one? The Legos, the whole nativity scene made out of Legos, pretty creative. Not so much Jesus junk, but you're really going to like this one. This one, next one is the hipster scene. So all you Gen Z, you know, We've got the Amazon delivery guys on Segways, and they're taking a selfie with Jesus, and, uh, you know, the, the cow says, 100% organic. So that, that's the hipster nativity scene. And, and I know I'm going to get a lot of blowback on this one, but I had to show it. It, it. Here we go. We got Trump, and we got Prince Harry, and Kanye, and, and that's, yeah, that's, that is the Trump scene right there. Uh, these nativity scenes come in all forms or fashions, and you'll see them take on cultural significance. Like you may see a Chinese scene where uh, all of the members of the nativity are, are Chinese. Uh, but uh, that is where we're at today. And, and you know, we've got one right here in front of us. In every one of these scenes, there's a couple of elements. You have Jesus and Mary and the baby and quite possibly some sort of animals, You have the wise men, and of course you always have the shepherds. That's what we're going to talk about today is we're going to look at the shepherds. Uh, But I want for just a moment, I want you just to imagine that you're God, just for a second. Uh, This isn't uh, anything weird, but just imagine that you're God for just a moment, and you have the most amazing, incredible, joyous news ever. And you know that this news is quite literally going to shock the world and change people's lives forever. That you're sending your son, your one and only son, into the world to take on the form of a human being, and this will be the Messiah that you promised long ago, the same Messiah that your chosen people had been longing for for thousands of years, and now the time has finally come for him to enter into the world. How would you announce it? How will will the king of all creation announce the birth of his son? I think I mentioned this a few years ago, but in England, the royal family actually has a particular protocol for a royal birth announcement. You know, the first thing above all, Prince Charles or King Charles now, he has to be notified. And they will announce... Uh, they will release an announcement at Buckingham Palace, and they have what's called a town crier. And he'll walk out the front door of Buckingham Palace, and he will read a proclamation to the crowd outside the gate. And then all over London, bells will begin ringing at Westminster Abbey and St. Paul's Cathedral, the Tower of London. That will At the Tower of London, they'll set off a 62-gun salute to announce the birth of the royal child. Trafalgar Square is going to be either illuminated pink or blue, depending upon 
uh, the, the sex of the child. Every television station, every newspaper, every gossip rag in the country is going to commit round-the-clock coverage of the new royal birth. But notice, that royal family isn't going to send out birth announcements to the cab drivers of London. The, the royal family is not going to send personal invitations to the kitchen staff at the local pubs. If any birth announcements are sent out, it will probably most likely be on some sort of parchment with gold leaf uh, and, and, and it'll be gilded on the edges and in very, uh, very anor- ornate font. But when the time came for the birth announcement of the king in the universe, God didn't choose the political or the religious leaders of the day to receive the news. He, he didn't choose the people that were in authority or power or in, uh, that contained influence. Instead, God used a rather unorthodox method for Jesus' birth announcement. He chose a few shepherds out on the outskirts of Bethlehem to be the first to receive the news. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 8. Let's read through the story together. Luke chapter, or Luke chapter 2, verse 8. That's where I need to be. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And they were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, and they were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those whom, with whom God is pleased. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried to the village and they found Mary and Joseph and There was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart, and she thought about them often. And the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. What we have here, this nativity scene, one of the most cherished and beloved parts of the Christmas story. And and think about every Christmas pageant you've attended. You're always going to have some guy in a bathrobe with a towel around his head, and he'll walk down the aisle carrying the staff. Maybe if, if they've invested a lot of money, they'll have a little sheep there, or maybe it's a dog that's been dressed up in some wool or something. But in every nativity scene that you, you come across, you'll find at least one shepherd figurine in, on that nativity scene. So think about the, the major characters of the Old Testament. When you think about people like Abraham, Moses, uh, Jacob, David, all of those guys actually have something in common. Those great characters in the Old Testament, all four of them, they, of course, they are highly regarded by the Jews. They are rock stars in Jewish history. But they all have similar vocations. Every single one of them are shepherds. For some reason, God chose shepherds to be the greatest characters in the Old Testament. Not a priest, not, not a king. I mean, can you, rem- can you name one warrior from the Old Testament that stands out? Can you name one priest? But you can, re- you can name Moses and David. You can name um, Jacob. You can name Abraham. All of those guys 
are shepherds. And so shepherds in the Old Testament, they were highly regarded. They, that was an honorable vocation. But by the New Testament, when the New Testament finally rolls around that time in history, being a shepherd in ancient Israel, eh, not so much a glamorous occupation. During the New Testament time, shepherds are nobodies. They're not special in any form or any fashion. They're, they're just common men doing a common job. Because you know what? It doesn't take any skill to be a shepherd. It doesn't take any education to be a shepherd. What is required of a shepherd? You have to be available. Because it's a 24-7 job. It requires all of their attention. You want to talk about the original blue-collar worker? That is a shepherd. And so by the New Testament times, being a shepherd was what you did when you couldn't do anything else. And so they, they were at the bottom of the social ladder. They're considered religious outcasts. And you've got to understand, the line of work they're in, it, it, it means that they, they can't participate in any of the religious feasts. They, they can't participate in the holy days. They can't even go to the temple. They, they can't observe the Sabbath because they have to work on the Sabbath. And so these men, these shepherds, were often said to be, quote-unquote, in violation of the law. They were ceremoniously unclean. Think about it. When a, a little lamb was born, who's going to pull the lamb? The shepherd. And, and so with all that dirt and grime, and the, they, they were just considered ceremoniously unclean. They couldn't go to the temple and worship. Their nomadic work habits meant that basically, in today's terms, they're somewhat of a, a gypsy or a carnival worker. They're untrustworthy. They, they can't give testimony in a court of law. <coughs> these particular shepherds that we just read about, these were the guys that were actually working in the night shift in that occupation. But it was a night that they would never forget. Because these were the men that God had sent the angel to announce the birth of the Son of God when he had come into the world. And so I began to ask the question, why? Why does God choose shepherds to receive the news first? I mean, it's, it's really kind of a head scratcher. If Here we have the most important announcement ever made in the history of all the earth. And, and, and you need it communicated to humanity. But God choose, God actually chose a, the most forsaken and unattractive people on the planet to share the message with. I right, think about it. If you got to get a message out in 3 BC that you need all of humanity to know about, shepherds would have been the least likely people that you would use for that press release. <coughs> Most likely, they would have chose, I mean, a better choice, probably a priest or the scribes or a Pharisee, maybe somebody in authority, <coughs> maybe a king, maybe a make the announcement to a prince or an emperor. But that's not how God usually works, is it? God, in his infinite wisdom, he chose lowly shepherds. But remember, God doesn't always do things for no reason. He doesn't do things with no purpose. There's always a purpose and always significance to his actions. You know why I think that God chose shepherds that night? Now, this is just my take. If you're taking notes, you want to pull out your study guide, look there on the back, number one. <coughs> I believe that God chose the shepherds because they're humble. You see, all through Scripture, we see that God draws near the humble-hearted. Think about it just for a second. I, I'm convinced that the, the two things in human life that God hates the most is arrogance and hypocrisy. 
And so all of, of all of the character traits that human beings possess, the one character trait that God favors is humility. Because humility is the antithesis of the root of all other sin, which is pride. You see, pride is the chief of sins. And humility is the highest of virtues. I want to read this to you out of Psalm chapter 138. Here's what it says. Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. He draws near, he prefers, he favors people who possess humility. And at that particular point in time in history of of everybody you can imagine, I mean, stack them up, make a list of every every particular occupation on the planet, every group of people on the planet, who are the most humble people? Shepherds. I mean, because when you're humble, you're not self-righteous, you're not self-important, and these shepherds, they possessed no spiritual pride. I mean, they weren't even allowed to worship properly. These shepherds, they definitely weren't self-important. For, for the last several decades, they've had people telling them that, that they're worthless. They, they've had people treating them as though they have no value. I think it's obvious. I think that those shepherds on that night, when those angels appear, were shocked and surprised that this message was coming to them. Because in their minds, why are we receiving this message? We're unworthy. We're, we're not adequate, we're, we're unclean, we're, we're unloved. And so that birth announcement, that night when those angels appear and say, we have good news, I, I think those shepherds were completely taken off guard. But the key to a humble heart, or one of the characteristics, one of the responses we see of, of a humble heart is they receive blessings gratefully. They recognize when they're being blessed. And people who are humble not only recognize that they're being blessed, but they respond appropriately. However, just imagine for just a second, what if that message had come to the scribes? What if that message had come to the Pharisees or the religious leaders there in the temple? What do you think their response would have been? Imagine that that angel appears to the Pharisees meeting in some back room in in Herod's palace or something. And it it makes this announcement. The son, the king of God has appeared and you'll find him in the manger in Bethlehem. How do you think the Pharisees would have responded to that? I think they would have been completely indifferent to it. I, I think there would have been unbelief or cynicism or or at the very least, they would be apathetic about what they're hearing. Uh, consider these, i got two verses here. Consider these verses in light of God's choice of the shepherds. Look at Psalm 69. I've got it on the screen here. Psalm 69, 32 says, The humble will see their God at work and be glad. Let all who seek God's help be encouraged. You get that? Don't you see that in the shepherds? Don't you see that they, they're, they're exposed to God's work here and they respond with gladness? And, and in Matthew 5.5 5 said, God blesses those who are humble for they will inherit the whole earth. So I think that is one of the main reasons that God chose those shepherds is because they're humble hearted. But you also need to understand there is a deep symbolic significance to the, the message coming to those shepherds. These shepherds raising those lambs in the foothills of Bethlehem, approximately six, seven miles from the temple, a lot of scholars believe that these shepherds are raising the very lambs that would go to the temple to be sacrificed at Passover. Do you see the rich symbolism there? I mean, to wor- these men are given a message and they go and they worship the Lamb of God who has come into the world to take away the sins of mankind. 
Psalm, I don't have this on the screen, but I, I love this. Psalm one eight or Psalm eighteen twenty seven says, "You rescue the humble." The rescuer is in that manger, and the humble are given the message, and and that Lamb of God, who they come and they worship, they they experience, they 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 get to be the first ones on the scene to witness the Lamb of God, and this is the Lamb of God who would ultimately be known as the Good Shepherd. I mean, the whole story is just so rich with symbolism. But number the next thing I want you to see here is that the good news is going to be a source of true joy. I mean, 30 years ago, when a child was born, birth announcements, usually sent out by mail, if you had a birth of a child, it, you might send out a birth announcement or maybe put it in the paper. I think that's what happened with me. I think there was an announcement that that Dan and Gail Mackey had given birth to a child. I think it was in the paper. That's how we used to do it back then. Today, technology takes over. I mean, you're going to tweet it out. You're going to post that good news on Facebook or Twitter. Some of you dads that kind of are a little mischievous, you'll take a, a picture of your wife still on the epidural holding the baby and post it to Instagram get a big kick out of that and she's going, you know, she's got one eye that's droopy and she's probably drooling on herself, you know, but it's like, hey, honey, you know, hey, that's going to be on Instagram. That's how we do it today. We, we use social media to make those announcements. But during the time of the Roman Empire, the, during that time, it was common for poets or, or orators to disclose the royal birth announcement to the world. Well, and so, if there was a future emperor that was born, like in Caesar's household, these orators, these poets, they, they would go outside the walls of the, uh, of the palace and they would announce that peace had come. That was the announcement they made. And God uses that same pattern here. Instead of that proclamation coming from Rome, it comes from the hallowed halls of heaven. And, and, and instead of a sharp-witted linguist that is going to be very witty and, and how he forms his poem to announce the birth of this emperor, we see God send angels with this message, and it's very simple. And it says, I bring you good news of great joy for everyone. The message that the angels are presenting is definitely good news. It's, it's the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. You see, at this particular point, God is making good on the promise that he had made mankind back in Genesis chapter 3 when he made the promise, I will send a Messiah to rescue you and save you from your sin. And now, here on that night, the Messiah, for whatever reason, at this particular point in history of man, the Messiah has come. He has arrived. And so the angels make the announcement. And what the announcement is, is they're actually announcing that God has fulfilled prophecy. There's a prophecy in Isaiah 61. I've got it on the screen. I want to share it with you. And think about the announcement and being made to shepherds. And here's what it says. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that the captives will be released and prisoners will be free. Think about that just for a second. Who is the best representation of the poor and the brokenhearted? The shepherds. I mean, don't, can't you imagine that they probably felt like they were prisoners to the religious law here? They, they couldn't go and worship. They were unclean. No, they, nobody wanted anything, anything to do with them. By announcing the birth to the shepherds, a clear message is being sent. The good news is not just for the haves. This is good news for all men. 
It's important. It's, it's good news for the haves and the have-nots. And so those people, those that are in authority, this message isn't just for you. This is for all men, including those who society has said is unclean or, or is untrustworthy. And so for the shepherds, this is truly good news of great joy because God had finally sent a Savior and now they get to participate. It's not news just for the scribes or the Pharisees or the religious leaders. This is a good news for all men. The last thing I want you to see here is, look down at verse 14. Look at the, the, the news that's contained in this message here. It says, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. That's out of verse 14. You see, Jesus is God's peace offering to mankind. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about peace in terms of an abolishment of a war. This is a, a deeper, more personal form of peace. This is peace that you and I can have with God. That's the peace that the angels are announcing. I mean, be honest for just a second. Take a moment. Be honest with yourself. There, it, it, there is chaos in every facet of our lives. I mean, you have chaos at home. You have chaos in your relationships. You have chaos at work. You have chaos in our communities. Our government, you want to talk about chaos. Our marriages, chaos. There's dysfunction and chaos and conflict and strife in every facet of our lives, even in our spiritual lives. You see, human beings, we are born in conflict with God. We're not naturally at peace with God. The moment that you take your very first breath, you are at odds with your Creator because you're born with a sin nature. We're all sinners, even me. I, I'm no different than anybody else. I'm just as broken and jacked up as all of us in here. We all have a sin problem. And those sins have separated us from God. And I can tell you, just read through the, the Bible and you'll see God hates sin. And he hates anyone who harbors sin. Colossians 1.21 said, you were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. That is a designation that I do not want to be associated with as being called an enemy of God. That will not end good. But this is the good news of Christmas. And the good news of Christmas is what the angels announced, that God has sent his son, and he has sent his son for one purpose, to make us right with God, to bring peace. Sin separates us from our Creator. And you know what? There is nothing you can do. There's no good work. There's no amount of money that you can give. There's no kind of religious experience that you can have that means that you can deal with the sin problem on your own. You are absolutely unable to accomplish a reconciliation with your Creator by yourself. God has to do it himself. God has to be the one to do it. And God took the initiative. Even though you and I are at fault, even though we are the ones that are the sinners, God took the initiative here. It says in Romans 5, 6, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and he died for us sinners. You see that baby that's lying in that, that feeding trough comes for a purpose to die, to die for you, to die for me, so that we could be reconciled to our Creator. We could have peace. That baby in the manger, 33 years later, he'll go to the cross and God will take all of the wrath that has been stored up towards mankind because of sin and he will pour it out on that baby who was lying in that manger. Jesus died to satisfy God's wrath. And because of that, anyone who would put his faith and his trust in 
that person, Jesus, you can absolutely live with confidence that you are now at peace with God. That is the reason why the angels, their message says, I bring you good news of great joy, peace on earth. I mean, face it. Just, look, just turn the television on. This world, nation and nation and person and person, there's never going to be peace. But the peace that you need is not peace between Hamas and Israel or between the Ukraine and Russia. The peace that this world needs is the peace that each individual needs with their creator. Now, the nativity scene is absolutely one of the most beloved parts of the Christmas story. And I mean, at this time of year, if you go to a Christmas parade, you're going to see some float uh, in the parade that's going to have some guys in some robes and they're going to be leading animals around or, or maybe you'll go to your kid's Christmas pageant and one of your kids will be the, 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 the shepherd that has the towel around his head or, and the staff. And, you know, thanks to St. Francis, everybody has a little nativity scene in their house. But I hope, here's my hope, that from now on, any time you see that, Anytime you see that parade with those shepherds on that float, anytime you go to that pageant, anytime you walk by the little nativity scene your wife has got on the coffee table or up on the mantle, anytime you see that from now on, I hope that those shepherds kept your, keep, or catch your eye. And I think you should know that God was very intentional about them being included in the story. And I hope that you will emulate those shepherds I hope you'll remember when you see those shepherds, you'll remember that Jesus came not for the rich and the haves, but for all men, even the lowest of the low, the lowest in the socioeconomic ladder. God came for you individually, no matter what station in life you have. And I hope you'll know that, that you will celebrate the good news of his birth with the same joy that those shepherds celebrated. I mean, think about it. When those shepherds heard the news, they went and they told someone else, you don't keep joy to yourself. And I hope you'll embrace Jesus as your king, just as those shepherds did, that, that you will recognize that it's possible to be at peace with your creator. But I hope of all the things that the shepherds do in the story, here's the thing I hope that you catch, is that we see that the shepherds take the message and share it with other people. Those shepherds, they don't just go back to the fields. They just don't go back to continuing to watch over the sheep. These nobodies go into the nearest village and they begin telling anybody and everybody who will listen what they'd seen. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 18, it says that everybody who heard them were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. That is the duty of every Christ follower on the planet. Anybody that has placed their faith in that baby that was in that manger has a duty and responsibility. The very last thing that Jesus said is, go tell someone else. Your responsibility, be like the shepherds, take the message of Christmas and share it with someone else. That, I mean, we talked, me and Ben was joking a little bit ago about Christmas shopping. Those gifts are but shadows of the greatest gift that you could give another person is to tell them the good news about what Christ has done when he came into this world. Share the message of Christmas. This Christmas, you're going to probably be sitting in a living room around the tree, and everybody's going to have packages at their feet, waiting in anticipation to, to rip the wrapping off and to open the packages to see what they've been given. Somebody stand up and say, before we do anything, let's read the Christmas story. Let me tell you about the King of Kings and the reason why we're doing what we're doing. That's the best Christmas gift you could give another person is for them to come to faith, to experience peace with their God.
Let's pray. Lord, I'm overwhelmed by the amount of love and the the massive love and the the strength and, and the purpose with which the Christmas story displays. God, we thank you for the the perfect plan that you set into motion over 2,000 years ago when you sent your son into the world to come and be born to a, a, a poor, outcast family. Lord, ultimately knowing what you're going to do, you are going to provide something that even if we had all the money in the world, we could never procure for ourselves. You came so that we could be made right with you. And I pray this Christmas that this world would would finally come to terms with what the Christmas story really means. That they wouldn't be distracted by the men in red suits or the, the colorful wrapping paper or the cell at the Menards. Father, I pray that men and women around the planet would begin to understand it is celebration of the fact that you did what we couldn't do for ourselves, and you gave us the gift of peace with you. And it's in that precious name of that child who was born on that starry night, Jesus himself, that we pray. Amen. Hi, thank you for watching. If you want to see more great content like this, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to ring the little bell to be notified when we add new videos. Since our founding in 1877, our goal here at Arnhart has been to create God-centered teaching available for everyone, regardless of their status or station. Today, that looks like making trustworthy Bible teaching available to everyone, even if they don't make it to a church building on Sunday. So for more information, check out our website at arnhart.org or join us live on Facebook Sundays at 1045 a.m. As always, we love you and hope to see you next Sunday.